so. Um, I hope you enjoy the talk. I hope this is interesting. So in the spirit of the 10th anniversary, maybe looking at a bit of uh, Ruby's origins. I think each iteration in Ruby is a very foundational concept. Very, um, it's also very telling about some of Ruby's um, Ruby's goals and uh, about the way that Ruby works. If you understand, I think, if you understand each, you understand a, a lot about Ruby, so hopefully this will be somewhat uh, informing as well. Uh, and I understand uh, from listening to Aaron's talk previously, he's in the other room stealing uh, all of the people who would otherwise be at this talk. Mm -hmm. uh, the, yeah, sure, let me, is this better? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, all right. So I understand from Aaron that it's very important to have a provocative title, so I have provided one. <laughs> and I, uh, like I said, my name is Rain Hendricks. I, I, I tweet and I blog. I work at a company called PHP Fog. I don't do PHP, I do Ruby. We do automated PHP deployment in the cloud. It's awesome. Uh, but that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about iteration. And I'm going to discuss external iteration, internal iteration, generators, and enumerators. I'm going to talk a bit about where they came from and how we use them in Ruby. External iteration is a concept that you're probably all familiar with. This is Java. Um, this, Java didn't uh, create external iteration, but it's probably the place that you've see, seen it uh, most often. External iteration is iterating over an object by using an object external to that object to provide the iteration. So this iterator object here is a, aware of how to take this list and get the next object in sequence. And this loop says that while there is a next object, <coughs> iterate by taking the next object and then continue on to the next object in the loop. And while Ruby can do external iteration, we don't often do it because Ruby has more powerful iteration concepts like internal iteration. Internal iteration is the, the collection object itself is able to enumerate its elements. And this is probably how you usually iterate when you see Ruby. And I'm going to talk a bit about how each works and how each is used as the basis of the enumerable module to provide a lot of other powerful behavior that are also powerful familiar with. So the each method is found in a number of places in Ruby, most commonly array, hash, and string, but also in a number of other places. Uh, the dir class, io, range, set, string, io, struct, a bunch of others, um, and also you can have an each in your own class. And I thought that explaining how to write each might give us a good understanding of how internal iteration works in Ruby at a deeper level. So I'm going to talk about writing each using a linked list class. How many of you are familiar with a linked list? Let me try that again. How many of you are not familiar with a linked list? Really? Okay, a linked list is a collection class that uses objects that have a pointer to the next object. So you start with the first object, and then you traverse those pointers to get to the next object and the next object until you run out of the next object. And we can write a linked list in Ruby by using a struct to represent each object in the collection. And that struct has a pointer to the next object and, and a container for the, the thing that it is representing. And we can initialize a list by pushing all of the arguments onto the list. And push is some magic that I won't explain. It basically creates a new node, and it assigns its object, and it assigns the previous nodes next to that node so it can be traversed to. So how would we write each? for a linked list class. First, let's talk about the semantics of each. In the, the uh, pickaxe book, the, uh, the original Ruby pickaxe book, each is uh, listed in the documentation as a method that calls a block once for each element in self and passes that element as a parameter. So these are the semantics of each. It calls the block once for each element, it passes the element as a parameter, and it doesn't mention this, but it also always returns self. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> so let's talk about how we can implement each. Uh, first of all, we're going to define each for our linked list class by taking the first node. Uh, part of the implementation of the linked list object is that it has a first accessor instance variable for the first object. So we're going to take that first node, and if there's a node, we're going to call the block. We're going to yield. Well, that's not a very complete each. It doesn't iterate, and it doesn't actually call the block on the object. So let's change that a bit. Let's start out by calling it once for each element. So we'll start out by turning this if into a while. And then we'll have the yield yield to the object by passing it as passing it to the yield. And one of the things that you may notice here is that this is a demonstration that an if is a degenerate while case, uh, which, which is slightly interesting. But more interesting is we now are able 
to, we, we satisfied the, the first part of the semantics of each. We iterate over each object in the linked list, and we pass that object as the parameter to the block using the unit. And then finally, we return self. So now we have each, let's do something with it. Let's take our linked list class, and let's, let's create a linked list object. And we do that in, in IRB, and that's ugly, and I don't like that. So let's, um, let's dive it really quickly and write a nice constructor method. Can you all read that? We'll write a nice constructor method that delegates to new, and then we'll write a nice output method, uh, or inspect, which is what IRB uses to print to the console. And now we can use IRB, we can create a linked list on the first line there, and then it's IRB output looks like the bottom line, which I think is a lot nicer. So we can use that now to demonstrate the behavior of each. That might be a little small. Can you all read that? It, uh, it's um, a linked list of the uh, integers one through four, and for each item in the list, it prints out the item. And so before we go any further, let's look at the inspect and ask ourselves, where did this 2A come from? We didn't define it. Where did, how did it get there? The answer is that it's inside enumerable. So we're going to talk about enumerable right now and how enumerable can add behavior to your collection classes that you define yourself and why it's awesome. So enumerable in the pickaxe is a mix-in provides collection classes with traversal and searching methods and a bunch of other cool stuff, sorting. And it provides 2A. So if we include enumerable, then that gives us 2A and we can use that in our inspect. So let's talk for a second about enumerable and how it uses each as the basis method to provide a lot of behavior for all of the objects in Ruby that have an each method that conforms to the contract that we talked about earlier in semantics. Let's pick a few enumerable methods and talk about implementing them. But instead of calling it enumerable, let's call it this, <laughs> because that's a valid module name. And so let's start with 2A. Here's a definition of 2A for our enumerable. We start out with an accumulator variable, this array variable to hold an empty array, and for each item, we append, we push that item into the array, and then we return the array. That's 2A as implemented in enumerable. Collect is similar to 2A, but instead of pushing the item onto the array, it pushes the return value of yielding the item to a block. How many of you are familiar with yield? How many of you are not familiar with yield? Awesome, I can skip like five slides, but I'm not going to. Yield is uh, very foundational, it's a core part of Ruby, and it, yield and blocks work together to do a lot of awesome stuff that I'm sure you're all familiar with, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. Yield um, invokes the code in a block, passing any arguments, and then when the block exits, the control picks back up immediately thereafter. So yield, we can demonstrate Thusly, we define a method that just has yield in it. We call that method with a block, and then the block is executed. Yield with an argument works similarly. We define that method to yield the argument. We call it with an argument and a block. And we can see that there, that block has a argument, has a block local variable, and it is interpolated into the string. So let's go back to our collect. Now that we um, know, I guess we already did, but now that we know about the behavior of yield, we can see that it takes the argument and it yields it to the block that you define. So let's talk about, now that we have collect, here's detect. For each item, return that item if the return value of yielding it to the block is truthy. And you're all familiar with the semantics of truthiness in Ruby. If it's nil or false, it's falsy, and if it's anything else, it's truthy. So select is similar, but instead of returning the first item, it yields that item if the result of yielding <laughs> the block is true. So these implementations that I've shown you are somewhat naive. They don't handle all of the possible arguments to some of the methods. If you want to see a full implementation, I would suggest you look at Rubinius, which is, of course, Ruby written in Ruby. And I would say that if there are C constructs in Ruby that you want to understand, at Ruby methods written in C, Reading their Rubinius equivalent is the best way to grok what they do without having to parse C in your brain, uh, which for some of you can be painful, like me. So now that we have our linked list, we can include our own enumerable module, and we can keep the same 2A in our inspect, and it'll still work. So what I want to talk to you about briefly, now that we've covered enumerable, is how you can use the idea of extending basis functionality with mixins to add 
behavior to objects that share some sort of basis behavior. So a basis method is a core method from which Mixin's functionality is described. Enumerable's basis method is each, meaning that any object that you have that shares a, um, an each method that conforms to the semantics we discussed, you can drop in enumerable and it'll just work and will provide you with all of the methods in enumerable. Likewise, comparable's basis method is this weird, um, what is it called, a waka? Waka equals waka, can we call it that? I've heard it called a spaceship. If you have a spaceship operator that returns a, a one, zero, or negative one, depending on what order two objects are, are relative to each other, including comparable will derive all of the less than, greater than, greater than or equals to methods from that. So, in addition to talking about using basis methods uh, and extending those methods with, with Mixin, I want, I want to talk to you about some of the core behavior of Ruby <coughs> and how it relates to classes that you write yourselves and how your objects play uh, well with other objects in Ruby's ecosystem. If you're writing a collection, its iteration method should be named each. If you want your object to do what you expect as a hash key, It'll depend on the implementation of hash and the EQL question mark method for determining whether two objects have are the same hash key. Um, also, the Ruby set class and some array methods like uh, intersection, union, and unique use a hash internally. So if you're trying to get the intersection of two arrays of your own objects and it's not working, what you actually have to do is you have to make them work in a hash as a key properly for that to work. So we're going to talk just very briefly about that about making your, um, making your objects play well inside a hash, because I think this is a good way to extrapolate a lot of other um, behaviors in the Ruby ecosystem and how you should write your objects to take advantage of them and to have expected behavior. So hashes depend on a hash method and an equal method. A uh, hash function, uh, as most of you probably know, is a function that takes an object, in this case an object in Ruby, and returns an integer, and that integer should, is much as possible be unique. Uh, the reason that hashes use uh, the equal method as well is because there are more objects than there are integers, so sometimes there's a hash collision and two objects will have this a hash function that returns the same integer. So this may be surprising to some of you who expected only hash to be necessary, but if you want your Ruby objects to work as you expect in hash keys, or as hash keys, you also need to find the EQL. Uh, Question mark. So a hash for a linked list should be unique to the list elements and should not conflict with other collections that may have the same elements. So if you have a linked list with the same elements as, a, as an array, their hash functions or their hash methods should return a different integer. And we can do that by taking a hash of its contents and XORing that with a hash of its class, which will provide a unique integer um, at least for um, comparing linked lists to sets or arrays, it will, it will be unique and will prevent hash collisions. The XOR is to prevent the odd case of the original hash returning, uh, combining these two in integers in such a way that they overflow into a big num, which we don't want. Uh, so the XOR will make sure that they always stay within the max int uh, range. And finally, uh, equal, needs to be defined uh, so that it has correct semantics, and this poses the question, what are the semantics of equal, and how do these equivalence methods in Ruby work? How many of you are familiar with the exact semantics of the equals equals, the EQL, and the equal methods in Ruby? Cool, awesome, okay. The equals equal methods checks whether two values are equal. Um, it doesn't check class or object ID. So a specification for equals equals is that a linked list with the same values as an array, when you compare that linked list to the array using equals equals, the response should be true. Equal compares the values and the class, and asserts that they must both be the same. For a linked list, that would be the equal method with the same values as an array should be false. You can make another method that says that two linked lists with the same values when compared using EQL should be true, and equal compares whether two objects are identical, that is, they have the same object ID. So in this case, two linked lists with the same values should not be equal, but they should be EQLD. 
And as a mnemonic, note that the strictness of the function is a, uh, the strictness is a function of the length of the method. So back to define an equal for the linked list. Uh, you can say that they're equal if their class is equal and their uh, values, their two array values are equal. Does that make sense? So the moral of the story, the reason that I went on this digression from iteration is that iteration is an example of a way that you can make your Ruby objects, in this case collection objects like a linked list, work well in the Ruby ecosystem. You can use enumerable to add behavior to those collection uh, classes that you may define to make them uh, behave more like an array and to make them more familiar to users of your class. Likewise, other objects that you define that may not be collections, that may not have iteration, should still be, uh, behave nicely in the Ruby ecosystem. Um, Jim Wyrick calls it being polite, and I would say that polite objects are objects that behave as expected inside Ruby, that, for instance, hash as expected as hash keys, or when you unique an array of linked lists, if they have the same values, they should not, they should be considered duplicates. So common Ruby semantics that your class should probably implement would include inspect for human readable output, a 2s, if it's applicable, some things just don't have a string. <coughs> but a 2s would be used internally in string interpolation and with printf. A 2proc, if your object is some sort of command object that takes parameters and then evaluates some sort of command and then returns a value, 2proc may be an appropriate uh, method to implement that it will allow Ruby to coerce your object into a block. 2i, 2f, 2a, and 2h for integer, float, array, and hash are um, loose coercion methods. That is to say that Ruby's, Ruby's definition of strictness in this case is that a object that has a 2i doesn't have to be isomorphic to an integer. It could have other properties. An address, for instance, could have other properties, but it may 2s to the string representation of the address. On the other hand, to int, to array, and to str are for objects that have strong, that are strongly related to integers, arrays, or strings. In fact, in Ruby, core, the only class that implements to str is the exception class. It's, it's not that common to see these methods implemented, but if you're, for instance, writing some other form of integer that uses a different representation, a to int method, may be a useful method for your class to have. So we were talking about iteration, and I want to get back to that now. We've talked about external iteration and internal iteration. Now I want to talk about generators. This is a language called Clue. Excuse me. This is a language called Clue. Clue was created at MIT by Bar Barbara Liskov uh, of the Liskov Substitution Principle uh, fame and her students between 1974 and 1975. It's a language that has abstract data types, making it somewhat of a forerunner of a lot of object-oriented concepts that we have today, although it did not have other concepts that we now think are necessary, like inheritance. One of the uh, constructs that Clue did have is a generator. And a generator, in this case, is a way of creating an external iterator. And you can see that Clue's syntax includes a very familiar method here called yields, which is actually the basis of the Ruby method yield. That's where it comes from. And Ruby has generators as well. But you don't, this is 1.9, or the enumerator library is also in the 1.8 standard library. But you don't use the generator directly. What you use is an enumerator. And here's an enumerator that creates a Fibonacci sequence. This yielder object is an enumerator yielder class and it's what's responsible for generating the next value in the sequence. That's, that's how the, it, it uses a generator internally uh, to provide an enumerator externally. So it's actually an interesting combination of internal and external iteration. The external iteration of a generator is wrapped in the internal iteration of an enumerator. So that you can say each on an enumerator and have it behave as if it were an, inter an internal iteration. But you can also say next and have it behave as if it were an external iteration. And what you'll notice about this Fibonacci sequence enumerator is that enumerators can be infinite lists. And they can be rainbow colored. <laughs> Maybe not rainbow colored, but definitely infinite. So you can take this Fibonacci sequence and take the first 10 values. Take as a method on enumerators. And that makes enumerators similar to 
some functional programming methods on uh, lists or arrays. So you can use enumerator to do some similar things that you may do in Haskell with infinite lists and take and whatnot. Although I would recommend not calling each on this. You might be there for a while. So in conclusion, I just want to leave you hopefully with the idea that each is, is a great method that encapsulates a lot of the elegance and simplicity of Ruby. Enumerable is double great for taking Ruby's elegant internal iteration and turning it into map and collect and inject and all of the other enumeration behavior that we love about Ruby. And please uh, use your enumerate, enumeration methods responsibly. Don't automatically use inject when there may be a better solution. Inject actually has a use case, but it is not the use case of each within the accumulation variable. So you don't have to have an extra line of code. When you write your own classes, try to make them play nicely with others. This may mean that you should re-implement core behavior such as hash or equal so that your object has semantics that are more appropriate to it. Look for common basis methods in your objects that you can extend to provide shared or, or familiar behavior such as each for collections. Don't be afraid to write mixins for your objects that give them such behavior, especially if they can extend common behavior in your system. And the more common that behavior is, the more powerful your mixin will be, which is why enumerator, for instance, is a more useful mixin than uh, comparable, because more things have each, and we use iteration more often. Uh, also, when you write your own objects and classes, you should be doing play nice with other developers by providing more useful input methods than new when appropriate, and by giving them human readable output. Don't depend on the inspect provided by object, it may not be very readable. And also, as an example of one of the more um, pernicious ways that objects may not play nicely, use hash and equal on your objects to define their semantics in a hash context. Finally, and this is an example of some of the power of Ruby's uh, iteration, I want to talk about list comprehension. How many of you are familiar with list comprehension? List comprehension is more commonly seen in, in functional languages like Haskell. It allows you to basically take a list or lists and comprehend over those lists into a single list. In Ruby, that's, um, that can be done. I'm more interested with the sort of degenerate list comprehension, which is take a single list and comprehend over that into um, another list, which is like collect, but instead of returning every value, it, you can use uh, in Haskell, for instance, in traditional list comprehension, you can use guard clauses so that, for instance, give me every x, for every x, give me x squared where x is odd or even. So for instance, in Ruby, we might want to write a slide, we might write, want to write code that looks like this. Can everyone see this? This is take the array uh, one, uh, one through four and a method called comprehend that we haven't written yet that takes every i, every integer, squares it, and then returns it if it's even. And that gives us 4 and 16. Now, how could we write this in Ruby? One way might be to use inject, start with an array, and then push onto the array the value of yielding the block if the value of yielding the block is truthy. That's sort of like a combination of collect and select, right? It does both the collecting and the selecting at the same time. We could also just use each and a temporary accumulator variable, which has the advantage of not being inject. But what I found when I benchmark all of these solutions is that the most elegant solution in Ruby, which is a combination of collect and then compact, was also the fastest. So this, uh, this gives you a good example of how using the elegance of Ruby can also sometimes give you a performance advantage. It's not necessarily true that elegance and performance are not mutually exclusive. So that is, uh, that is my talk. I would love to uh, answer any questions you might have. We've got a few minutes left. So I might have missed it, but I don't think you mentioned the requirement of the semantics between equal quotes, EQL question mark and hash. I'm sorry? Basically, the requirement that if two objects are, are respond to the EQL question mark, 
they have to have the same hash. In other words, that, there's an implication requirement. Yes, there's an implication that if two objects have the same EQL question mark behavior, they have the same hash. So if two objects are equal in that, in that sense, they should have the same hash. And the way that we define hash, you could actually use hash to implement equal if you wanted to, although I would shy away from that because it would be less, slightly less correct because of possible collisions. So you could say equal is true if the hash is of the two objects. Well, well I don't know, because the reason for that implication is that the hash basically puts the value into a set yes. of, 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 of things that, that are equal. Or equal. Right. And right. then you have to, or, well, actually, it may or may not be equal. Sure. And the reason that you use, so the reason that wouldn't work is that the point of equal in the context of hashes is to differentiate between objects that otherwise collide, that otherwise have the same hash key. Mm -hmm. So it is true that all objects that have the same hash should be equal, uh, but it is not true that all objects that are equal should have the same hash. Uh, I think it's the other way around. Did I flip those two? Yeah, you have, it's the other way around. Yeah, right? sorry. The, the idea is that hash is generally cheap to do, right. equal may be expensive. You're using hash so to avoid having to compare each other. And then when you find collisions, you use equal. Right. right. Yes. What, whatever I meant to say is, is what I is said. What, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you said it. <laughs> yes. There is, and I have it in my slides here, there is an enumerable method called select, let me find it, which is return all of the objects in this collection for which yielding it to the block, the object to the block returns true. And I have it, somewhere. there we go, select, yes. So for each object in the collection, if yielding that object returns a truthy value, add that object to the collection. So, for instance, if my collection is the, uh, the range from 1 to 10, and my block is, is the object odd, that would return 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9. Yes? Why would inject be bad in that case? Inject is not bad in that case, it's unnecessary. And to the extent that it's unnecessary, I prefer to use simpler constructs. It seems like inject would be simpler there because you don't have to set up your collection outside of your loop. No, because you're trying to return another collection. So if you did this with inject, you basically have to inject some empty collection, or do something like inject an empty collection into it, and then accumulate the result, right? Yeah, right. The, so the, base, the base case for inject is things like summing things up. Right. Right. You're going to so get one value out of a collection. I, there are there are basically okay. the question is why wouldn't you use inject here? And I can give you two answers. One is that a in in the case where the purpose of this method is to define an enumeration, using another enumeration that is not the basis method each imposes overhead both conceptually and performance overhead. Well, all, all, of the, all of the enumerator methods depend on each and only require each. They could be written in terms of each other, but it's easier um, and typically faster to write them in terms of each. You, yes? You, you made it seem like you generally dislike inject for the reason most people use it. Is that because it's just... I uh, like, I like, in, I dislike inject, but I like reduce, even though they're synonyms, because I feel like the use cases for reduce it is completely appropriate to use reduce for things like summing all of the, um, the payments in this account together. I feel like it's not appropriate uh, to use inject when you really just want an accumulator array and each. Isn't, isn't reduce an accumulator? I'm sorry? Isn't reduce an accumulator? Yes, yes it is. It's back. reduce in- Is there a semantic difference between the name inject and the name reduce? Yes. I, reduce is, uh, in a functional context, what you would call fold L, which is to say that you start with the first object and you fold other objects into that object using some sort of composition method until you end up with one object. That's reduce. Inject is uh, semantically vague, which is why I don't like to use it. Um, reduce, on the other hand, has very well understood semantics and is very, in some cases, especially cases where your composition method, for instance, is the binary plus method is addition and you're summing. That, that I think is a very elegant 
the use case for inject or reduce, but I prefer to call it reduce in that case because that is semantically closer to the operation I perform. Questions? All right, well, I, I get to let you guys out early. Thank you very much.